this is our Akuma International Architecture Month. Um, so we we're doing uh, the whole theme of this month is architecture of resilience. As you know, this is our third week and the fifth speaker. So tonight we are talking about architecture, um, uh, resilience as culture, and we have a very special guest here with us. Um, Azra Akshamia will be joining us. I'm actually very happy, very um, also a bit nervous, I have to admit, because I'm a big fan of Azra uh, from my early uh, days as a master's student. She's been a very big inspiration uh, for me personally. So, um, so I'm so happy to be able to say hello and to welcome her. So just briefly about Azra, briefly, because there's so much to say about Azra. She uh, is an artist and an architectural historian. She's the director of the MIT Future Heritage Lab and an associate professor at the MIT Department of Architecture, Programming Art, Culture and Technology. Um, her artistic practice and academic research explore how social life is affected by cultural bias and by deterioration and destruction of cultural infrastructures within the context of conflict, migration, and forced displacement. So she does hold um, a diploma or undergrad from uh, University of Technology in Graz. She did her master's at Princeton. She got, she got her PhD at MIT. She also holds a hon uh, honorary, honorary doctorate uh, from Montserrat College of Art. And so there's so much more to say about Azra. Her work has been um, displayed and exhibited in leading international venues, um, such as uh, Generali Foundation in Vienna, Museum of Contemporary Art in Zagreb, Belgrade, Vienna Sculpture Center in New York, so many more venues as well. Um, she's the author of two books. She's also edited one book. Um, She's received uh, the Aga Khan Award for Architecture in 2013 uh, for her design of the prayer space in the Islamic Center in Austria. And she also won the Art Award of the City of Graz in 2018. I could go on and on about Azra, uh, but I think, I think this will do, I hope, for, for kind of a brief introduction. So Azra um, did pre-record her lecture, but it would be great if maybe she could just say a few words for us since she is here with us all the way from Boston and I know there's a time difference and I know she's teaching today so Azra thank you thank you so much for being with us it's such an honor and such a pleasure uh, to have you here you just have to unmute oh, perfect can you hear me yes, yes. Thank yes. you so much, Leila and Claudia, for your um, invitation to speak here, and thank you for your generous introduction. I'm really excited to be part of Kuma International um, in following the events, and it's really impressive how you also managed to continue to keep the spirit uh, alive now in the COVID uh, pandemic times. Um, the topic of cultural resilience is very dear to me. I have a body of work dedicated to this theme and many of us coming from the region are concerned uh, with this subject. We have experienced it and lived uh, with it uh, through our lives. So I'm really excited to be able to share some of the work um, today. Um, Leila asked me to talk specifically about the Culture Shutdown Initiative um, the lecture that I pre-recorded also includes some other projects that uh, there's a kind of whole uh, group of works that built on each other over the course of 10 years, I would say, um, and uh, that I try at the end to situate in the discourse of uh, contemporary art and architecture, looking specifically at the role of um, cultural institutions in, in crisis zones. So I hope that we can have a fruitful discussion in an hour. The lecture is about an hour. The first uh, couple of, um, let's say, 45 minutes are specifically about uh, Bosnia and these projects uh, on uh, questions of heritage and um, museum crisis uh, in the region. And then I wrap up with a more kind of uh, art um, perspective in the broader context. So, you know, you can tune in and out as, as it uh, works and we can clarify any misunderstandings or points later in the Q&A. Perfect. Thank you, Azra. So we look forward to having a discussion uh, afterwards. So I'm actually going to play the video from my end, um, right? 
Um, yes. And, and, and then Please, I have a little bit unstable internet uh, right now, so I would be grateful if you could play. Perfect, of course, no problem. So let me share this screen uh, with everyone and then um, we're looking forward to discussion afterwards. It is October 4, 2012. Dozens of protesters, students and artists, citizens of Sarajevo are gathered in front of the entrance to the National Museum of Bosnia and Herzegovina, witnessing what has already become a historical event. The doors of the museum are to be locked and nailed shut with wooden panels, as if a tornado were on the horizon. In red handwritten letters, Zatvoreno and closed are inscribed on the panels, making it clear that the Bosnian National Museum is being closed to the public for the first time in its 124 years of existence. Cultural activists have mobilized in a desperate attempt to save the cultural heritage of Bosnia and Herzegovina in response to the lingering effects of the 1990s war. The Dayton Peace Agreement signed in 1995 put an end to the bloodshed, the genocide and the militarized combat, yet it simultaneously displaced the ethnic conflict from the sphere of the armed forces to the sphere of culture. Today, more than two decades after the war, the battle over history, memory and territory is far from over. The war is still waged through political instrumentalization of language, art, monuments and museums. The shutdown of the National Museum of Zemais or Zemaisky Muse is an outcome of this struggle. Six other state-level institutions in Sarajevo, including the National Art Gallery and the National and University Library, are on the verge of shutting their doors to the public because of their unresolved legal and political status, which echoes in the lack of funding, programming and research capacity. In direct response to this cultural crisis, hundreds of artists and academics and students and cultural workers from all over Bosnia and Herzegovina and around the world have stepped up in a joint effort to save the country's national museums, libraries and galleries. This lecture explores the notion of cultural resilience through the lens of these cultural shutdowns in order to learn from the unprecedented cultural solidarity movement that this crisis unleashed among the institution's various constituencies, I call this emerging phenomenon the Museum Solidarity Lobby. From direct action to nonviolent activist tactics, through academic interrogations of museum and national governance, to artworks critiquing normative preservation methodologies, to multi-annual collective effort of museum constituencies Get, uh, generated a condition of informal institutionality aimed at rescuing the social mission of the museum, the mission of linking the past with the present to anchor a shared cultural and political identity. From the top-down nationalist bureaucracies, putting it back into the hands of the public. Let me first clarify some terms that I will be using in this lecture. I deploy the term lobby for its double engaged meaning. First, a lobby can denote a group of people, representatives of an interest group, working together to influence government decisions on special issues. Lobbying can be performed by various groups and types of people, ranging from individuals, corporations, advocacy groups, and non-governmental organizations. Lobbyists operate outside of the government to influence public policy and legal decisions according to the agenda. In this context, the term can also have negative connotations associated with corruption and conflict interests. For example, when socioeconomically powerful groups lobby to twist the law to suit their own interests, which can create a disadvantage for the less powerful and lessen the government's ability to serve the public interest. The second meaning of the term lobby is spatial. It refers to a foyer or anteroom, for example, a hotel lobby or a museum lobby. And here you see a project of mine in the 
Museum of Contemporary Art uh, in Ljubljana that uh, deals with that um, notion of spatial lobbying. Etymologically, the term is derived from the lobbies of the British Parliament where members of, uh, assembled to vote during a division. As such, the term also implies a space of informal or unofficial deliberation, uh, that social space just outside or just before the legislature. In this lecture, I'm co-opting these meanings of the term lobby to explore how culture can inform new kinds of citizen engagement in governments. The different projects that I will present in my talk are situated among the various artistic and activist efforts that have taken place around the question of the future of the national institutions in the context of national spaces of the Western Balkans. Among the first to act was the Sarajevo-based conceptual artist Damir Nikšić. In 2011, Nikšić occupied the National Gallery of Bosnia and Herzegovina following an announcement that the gallery would be shut down. This occupation lasted for 83 days, during which Nikšić was calling for a quote, gathering of intellectuals, artists and experts, end quote. To organize this gathering in an artistic form of occupation, he invited Sarajevo's prominent intellectuals and cultural acteurs for recorded conversations that were held in the National Art Gallery and were broadcasted daily via his YouTube channel throughout the entire period of the intervention. Nikšić proclaimed himself the Minister of Culture, taking on a position as literally the country's only Minister of Culture. This role-taking called attention to the fact that Bosnia and Herzegovina lacks a state-level Ministry of Culture to represent all the ethnic groups in the country. Nikšić's intention was to lobby for a new constitution for Bosnia and Herzegovina, critiquing the present constitution, quote, as racist, segregationist, and found illegal by the European Court of Human Rights, end quote, as he phrased it. In this sense, Nikšić's action linked uh, the cultural crisis of Bosnia and Herzegovina directly to the disintegration of Yugoslavia and the subsequent political instability of the two past decades, pointing at the absence of a state-level cultural ministry as symptomatic of a lack of shared perspective on the country's history, identity and sovereignty. A year later, when the National Museum of Sarajevo um, shut down in 2012, a series of protests and spontaneous actions were organized by various groups in public spaces, both inside and outside of Bosnia and Herzegovina. These included various activist groups, such as the anti-Dayton movement uh, and numerous protesters from universities and high schools. The third gymnasium and the first Bosniak gymnasium even presented the government of Bosnia and Herzegovina Federation with an action plan to rescue the National Museum. Following the 68th European Forum Alp, um, Alpbach, members of the initiative group Alpbach in Sarajevo organized the fourth Sarajevo World Cafe at the School of Economics and Business in 2012, discussing the future of culture and art in Bosnia and Herzegovina, as well as the role uh, of all the relevant institutions, governmental and non-governmental, in improving the culture of arts um, uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Beside the local lobbying activities, a number of regional and international cultural institutions organized various campaigns and actions involving major um, transnational museum networks, such as the International Council of Museums, ICOM, and the International Committee for Museum and Collections of Modern Art, CIMAM. The Museum of Contemporary Art Metelkova, that you see here in the image together with my artwork Museum Solidarity Lobby, and the Moderna Galleria in Ljubljana have been continuously documenting and archiving accounts of these cultural protests over the years. Bosnian artists living outside of the country produced many critical reflections directed at the Bosnian public and the world. For example, Sarajevo-born artist Tanja Softić, currently a professor of art at the Department of Art and Art History at the University of Richmond in Virginia, created a photographic essay called Catalogue of Silence in 2014, 
presenting her research about the conditions of the threatened museums and libraries in Sarajevo 20 years after uh, the war. She dedicated this work to, quote, those who work to keep the flame of art, culture and scholarship alive anywhere in the world, end quote. Sarajevo-born and New York-based artist Nebojša Šeric Šoba created a video piece pointing to the private funding models of the major museums in New York, addressing the Bosnian public with the question of whether the state or the private sector needs to be responsible for providing the funding for a state-level institution. Inspired and informed by all these actions, and also by my previous research about the cultural dimensions of the 1990s Balkan Wars, I um, wanted to mobilize my international network of artists and scholars to connect the realms of art, academia and museums and to, uh, share, uh, to lobby for shared heritage. To that end, I created um, a range of in cultural infrastructures and artistic activities aimed at addressing um, the cultural and political crisis in Bosnia and Herzegovina. In January 2013, together with my colleague Maximilian Hartmut, an art historian working at the University of Vienna, I launched the Culture Shutdown platform, operating through a website that I've been running um, technically and conceptually um, for um, a decade. The platform was set up as an international civic platform that operates through a website and connects uh, artists, cultural workers and activists across geographic and disciplinary borders. The shared task was to uh, research the causes of the crisis and to provide creative and uh, critical responses from a number of disciplinary um, perspectives. We formed um, a focused editorial board consisting of local and international journalists, art historians, political scientists and librarians, including Selma Gicevic Akshamia, Asya Mandic, Yasmin Mujanovic, Susan Pierce, Andras Riedlmeier, Jeff Spur, and Mladen Vukovic. Subsequently, we formed a wide international network gathering more than 50 international artists, scholars and experts from various fields who uh, at the point had already been lobbying against uh, this crisis in the realms of their respective disciplines. Culture Shutdown's mission is to host and give visibility to various individual responses and attempts to resolve the acute crisis of cultural institutions in the region. Over time, this platform has grown in scope and depth into a global network connecting cultural producers who voluntarily lobby through their own and collaborative work. The shared objective is to envision a better future for Bosnia's war-torn society and to reimagine through a cultural dialogue new modes of coexistence and citizenship in the region. Yet reaching this objective necessitated a systematic investigation of the causes behind the museum crisis, looking beyond the established understanding and the budgetary problems that were the source of institutional collapse. To that end, I collaborated with um, many different people. Um, here you see an image of Tanya Softic, who uh, did her own uh, research on the causes and conditions of the institutions. Um, with Cultural Shutdown's um, editorial bo board members, Selma Gicevic Akshamia, we uh, created a, a case study uh, and uh, she interviewed the representatives of all affected institutions, mapping their status quo and um, collecting the institution leaders' individual perspectives on the crisis. After this survey was completed, the Culture Shutdown's editorial board issued a report unifying all these museums' individual problems into a joint perspective, showing how all of them are affected by a common concern. Collecting all these voices into one was important because the affected institutions had not previously been working together um, to address the problems that affected them all. The survey of the status quo has led us to a key discovery. The cultural institutions in Bosnia and Herzegovina had no respective legal status as state-level institutions. 
while each of them is, exists physically, they were established during the previous regime and um, as regional level institutions of Yugoslavia's Federal Republic of Bosnia and Herzegovina, none of these institutions were legally recognized as state level institutions when Bosnia and Herzegovina became an independent state and established its constitution through the Dayton Peace Agreement in 95. The state of Bosnia and Herzegovina thus never proclaimed, yes, this is my state museum, or no, it is not my museum. That is to say, these museums exist as tangible remains of the previous political regime, but they do not exist on paper as legally defined national institutions of the post-Yugoslav state of Bosnia and Herzegovina. It soon became evident that the, this problem of a lack of legal status affects all the other problems because no one feels responsible for securing sustainable financial, uh, financial um, uh, means for these institutions. Take, for instance, the ongoing um, uncertainty around the museum leadership. If no one is legally owning the museum, who is then in charge of ensuring accountability to the museum. Who will be appointing the next museum director when the current leadership uh, retires? So the first lobbying agenda for the cultural shutdown platform was to promote the awareness about not just the lack of funding, but the unresolved political conflict and the lack of shared will for having a multi-ethnic, multinational state of Bosnia and Herzegovina. At the time of a post-war dystopia characterized by deterioration of social and economic infrastructures, another important aim was to promote an understanding of why is it important to have cultural institutions at all. We argued that museums are valuable for the ways in which they serve as keepers of cultural memory. In a society recovering from the consequences of war, Museums and archives represent a contested sphere. Bosnia and Herzegovina's museums are in crisis precisely because they preserve the memory and material evidence of existence and coexistence that were targeted during the war. We might view Bosnia and Herzegovina as a mini model of Europe, a place where different cultures and civilizations have met and lived together for centuries. This coexistence was not always peaceful, but the cross-cultural exchange and fertilization was quite dynamic throughout history, as it is very much evident in the region's rich cultural heritage. In almost every village and city in Bosnia and Herzegovina, major religious buildings of the Muslim, Catholic, Orthodox Christian and Jewish faiths literally stand side by side. And this cultural heritage represents the material evidence of the cultural detente that was put in practice over generation, and it is precisely what nationalist extremists targeted during the 1992-95 war. Mosques, churches, libraries, archives and museums were targeted deliberately, and this destruction reached a wide scale. For example, over 70% of the Islamic religious architecture in Bosnia and Herzegovina was destroyed or significantly damaged. In 1992, the National Library of Bosnia and Herzegovina in Sarajevo was attacked with incendiary grenades. When Sarajevo citizens built human chains to try to rescue books from being burned, they were shot by snipers who were making sure that firefighting operations could not be executed. Andras Riedlmeier, the director of the Aga Khan Documentation Center at the Harvard University and international editorial board member of the Culture Shutdown Platform, has called this destruction the largest single incident of deliberate book burning in modern history. The systematic destruction during the war in Bosnia and Herzegovina represents, in fact, a process of territorial conquest and demographic rearrangement through ethnic cleansing and genocide, as evidenced in the demographic maps of the country from before and after the 90s war. The ethnic constellation before the war, as you see here on the top left in the image, 
shows that all the ethnic groups were distributed evenly across the entire country, while after the war, as seen as the bottom left, the three main ethnic groups were separated into three homogenized ethnic territories. And this new and brutally constructed demographic landscape was then confirmed through the territorial arrangement of the Dayton Peace Agreement, which split the country into two political entities, the Serb Republic and the Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Constituted and constructed through genocidal action, this internal political division is considered unacceptable by many and has led to a post-war continuation of the conflict within the cultural sphere. Today, the ongoing battles are taking place over history and memory as cultural heritage has become a political instrument. The museum crisis uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina exemplifies this ongoing struggle. In one part of the country, people say, well, this is not our history and not our national museum. We have our own history and we have our own museum. Another part of the country is saying, well, we need a shared cultural ministry and a shared national museum to counter the effect of the ethnic cleansing and the genocide. In the end, Bosnia's National Museum fell victim to the, a contest between a pluralist vision of the state and an ethnically inclusive one. In the former, a coexistence and the weaving of the relations between ethnic groups are the drivers of the creativity. In the latter, the history is framed to support the primordialist idea of nationalist identity. The second agenda for the Culture Shutdown platform was to promote an understanding of museum as symbols and instruments of um, reinstituting the idea of Bosnia and Herzegovina as a multi-ethnic state. To that end, we were seeking ways for people in Bosnia and Herzegovina to reclaim their shared history and create a new cultural capital for the shared state um, to counter the violence of war and competing nationalisms of today. That necessitated making the case for cultural preservation and for the museum as an instrument for state building and peace. I initiated the participatory project called Museum Solidarity Day, inviting museums and galleries worldwide to act in solidarity with the Bosnian counterparts. Participants were invited to sign up on our website, after which I sent them the strip of our yellow barricade tape featuring the Culture Shutdown logo. The tape was uh, to be used um, to cross out one artifact of the recipients choosing uh, in their own collection. Each um, participant was asked to take a picture of this uh, one day long action uploaded online. This is one example. All images were uh, to be exhibited in an online exhibition and shared among all other participants under a Creative Commons license for the purpose of this uh, lobbying activity. The production of this campaign, as you can imagine, was a complex um, logistical action. Using my discretionary funds and art grants from MIT, I hired my students to help me find contacts for approximately 2,000 directors of galleries and museums worldwide and had personal emails written to each of them. In prom uh, promoting the public call for participation, I got a lot of support from colleagues uh, all around the world, which was really crucial for the success of the action. This is Denka Badovinac, director of the museum, uh, Contemporary and Modern Art um, in Ljubljana was especially instrumental in promoting this project through CIMAM, of which she was uh, the president at the time. My colleagues from Rotor, Center for Contemporary Art in Graz, Austria, organized the participation of all the cultural institutions in the city and disseminated the call through their networks. International art net news publishing platforms such as Eflux distributed uh, the call uh, through uh, their global outreach and all of that free of charge. After a couple of institutions participated, the action went viral and global, reaching over 390 institutions in 40 countries on five continents, 
with everyone using the same visual trope of the cross-out artifact censored for one day. The participants included major national museums, history museums, contemporary art museums, and a number of Jewish and Holocaust museums, art galleries, and universities. And you see here um, the German Historical Museum, the National Art Museum um, in Kiev, and um, artifacts also across the Parsons New School for Design in New York. Other examples include also kind of animated facades at the Kunsthaus Graz in Austria, the Jewish Museum in Hohenems in Austria, um, you know, alluding to the kind of book burning during the Nazi era. Many Jewish and Holocaust museums all across Europe uh, participated in this call. Some participants, especially students, went as far as to center, censor their own bodies, wrapping themselves in barricade tape. I especially like this little shark, um, also crossed out in a National Museum of Zadar in Croatia. A highly significant outcome was that many institutions from Bosnia and Herzegovina, Slovenia, Croatia and Serbia supported this campaign, sending a political signal to the institutions in the Serb Republic of Bosnia and Herzegovina, which had boycotted the call. Here you see some examples of uh, crossouts uh, in bon Bosnian institutions. Here are a few from Slovenia, from the City Art Gallery in Ljubljana, the Museum of Modern Art Ljubljana, and the Metelkova. Um, our Croatian colleagues, uh, who are really well organized in a network of museums, uh, have um, gathered and managed to mobilize a huge amount of institutions and uh, participation in Croatia was really, really significant. And here are some of examples from Zagreb, Dubrovnik and Trogir. The actions of solidarity in Serbia proper represented a powerful counter statement to um, nationalists in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And you see here um, examples from the Museum of Yugoslav History in Belgrade and also um, from the gallery of uh, Matica Srpska in Novi Sad. The presentation of all the collected photos achieved a major media presence in Bosnia and Herzegovina through national TV and radio channels paying tribute to the museum workers who had been keeping these institutions alive for 20 years with minimal and irregular salaries. Paying respect to the workers was very important because they had been previously publicly perceived as unprofessional and not able to gather funds for the museum. Subsequently, I used the crowdsourced images to create an exhibition of the cultural shutdown banners on the facades of the affected museums, uh, where they were displayed for more than a year. This production of an exhibition was organized by Sandro Drinovac, the graphic designer of the banners and the Future Heritage uh, Collection uh, 2 project, who teaches at the Academy of Fine Arts in Sarajevo. Despite these moving and global acts of solidarity, we should not forget that um, the establishment of the National Museum in Bosnia and Herzegovina was part of an Austro-Hungarian colonial project. The Count K monarchy founded uh, the museum in 1888 to recreate the cultural identity of the region, which up to that point had been part of the Ottoman Empire. The museum's collection has never been significantly revised since the 1990s war. Hence, the third agenda for our lobbying activity was to provoke a discussion about the content of the museum's collections. In this context, I developed the project titled Future Heritage Collection, which aimed to relocate the discussion about cultural preservation from the realm of the closed doors of state bureaucracies and academia to the public realm and ask the following questions of citizens um, of Bosnia and Herzegovina. What is to be preserved for the future? If your museum is closed, could you take on the responsibility to be the curator of your own heritage? 
what is missing in these collections and what would you store in this kind of museum? So for this project, I stage myself as an um, archaeologist from the future, suggesting that aliens have come to, into contact uh, with the inhabitants of Earth and asking citizens of the world to propose one artifact of cultural heritage that would represent Dear citizen of the world, a hundred years from your, your present, humankind, humankind has, finally has finally established, established contact, contact with another with planet. planet. Humans, Humans are about to send a spacecraft with documentation, with documentation about heritage, about heritage representing, representing or embodying the cultural, cultural memory, memory of our world. Of our world. Through time, Through travel, time travel, I have arrived, I have arrived to, include to include your voice, your voice in this selection, in this selection process. process. As the Earth As the Earth's representative, representative inhabitant, inhabitant, you have, you the, have right the right to select, to select one, one example, example of cultural, of cultural heritage. heritage. Can you tell Can you me tell what me would you, what pick you pick and why? And why? Please send Please me send a proposal, proposal by sending, by sending out, out this card. This card. Thank, you. Thank you. So there are 10 of these questions about politics of cultural heritage and pro approaches to preservation. So the first one you saw uh, with a question about um, I don't know, global heritage. Um, the second question she asked whether access to cultural heritage um, that is currently inaccessible should be considered a human right. Uh, all of these questions are based on uh, kind of existing problems of, uh, and dilemmas of our ethics of preservation in different parts of the world. And there are also some um, humorous ones, such as this one that is addressing expertise in preservation, as exemplified by the restoration gone wrong of the Exohuomo fresco in the Sanctuary of Mercy Church in Borja, Spain, where the local amateur artist Cecilia Gimenez restored the face of Jesus according to her own standards and was subsequently mocked and laughed at by the entire world. The archaeologist from the future, however, questions the public shaming of Gimenez's restorative intervention, claiming that she has become a very famous artist in the 22nd century precisely because her preservationist intervention is considered to be a masterpiece. The Future Heritage Collection project took place in uh, two phases. In the Future Heritage Collection number one, I used the video as a prompt for my artistic research and conducted interviews with various historians and curators and preservation experts. In the second phase, the Future Heritage Collection two, I used the same video for a public call for participation in establishing um, the Future Heritage Collection in Sarajevo, which was distributed through various media channels. Working with the Rotor Center for Contemporary Art, various artists and the curator Leila Hodžić from Sarajevo, I initiated a public discussion about the museum's collections which took place within the International Theatre Festival Mess in Sarajevo. We invited local artists, cultural workers and NGOs such as Akcia to discuss the contents of the Bosnian Herzegovinian um, museums and other cultural institutions. A temporary office of the Future Heritage Collection was set up at the Java Gallery in the center of Sarajevo where members of the public were invited to bring artifacts of cultural heritage that represented a shared uh, Bosnian and Herzegovinian history and that they would hope to see preserved in the National Museum. Each of the collected artifacts were then photographed, displayed and catalogued during the show, allowing Sarajevo's residents to follow in the real time the establishment of a collection in the making. Many interesting examples were brought in, such as a sample of embroidered textile that appears to feature embroidery patterns characteristic for Islamic arts and crafts, but it was brought by a participant who explained that this cloth was her wedding band, an important element of Serbian wedding tradition in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Images of the artifacts were transformed into postcards to which the participants were able to add their own stories. The postcards were then later given as a gift to the Center for Cultural Heritage, uh, International Forum Bosnia, and Amra Haji Mohamedovic, uh, who is generously um, using and distributing them publicly. 
While our lobbying activities have been informed by the previous actions of citizens of Bosnia and Herzegovina, students, artists and cultural workers, they have also informed the establishment of subsequent lobbying undertakings in the region. One of the succeeding actions included the wide-reaching campaigns conducted by Akcia, an independent cultural NGO based in Sarajevo. Starting in January 2015, Aida Kalender, um, program director of Akcia, collaborated with photographer Ziah Gafic in photo-documenting and recording the personal stories of museum workers. 38 portraits of museum workers were exhibited in the show titled The Guards of the Museum, Chuvari Musea, while the museum was still closed. The visitors had to enter the exhibition from the museum's back gate. This exhibition not only acknowledged the dedication of the museum workers over the past two decades, who have been almost voluntarily working for the museum due to irregular salaries. The project provided a basis for another powerful campaign of Akcia, uh, uh, I am the museum, Jasa Muzej, which invited participants from many segments of Bosnian and Herzegovina public, uh, for example, politicians, religious leaders, high school students, different independent organizations, to spend a night in the museum and uh, perform a duty of a guard. Over a period of 45 days, more than 5,000 people took on the role of museum guard. The campaign made the citizens responsible for preserving their own history and institutions. Ultimately, Akcia's lobbying activities have transferred the spirit of culture shutdowns international lobbying to the regional realm of Bosnia and Herzegovina. This well-executed cultural campaign led to the reopening of the National Museum on September 15, 2015. This effort of the cultural workers of the National Museum of Akcia, among other activists, was acknowledged by the European Union Prize for Cultural Heritage, the Europa Nostra Award 2016. The culmination of all the processes of cultural lobbying has also led to some successes uh, on international and regional scales. These efforts now continue through discursive projects and exhibitions in the realm of the museum itself. My own work, um, for example, the Museum Solidarity Lobby projects were featured in the show Inside Out, The Not So White Cube, curated by Alenka Gregoric and Suzana Milevska, uh, which started at the City Art Gallery in Ljubljana in 2015, which then traveled to the Contemporary Art Museum in Belgrade, where it was expanded into the exhibition titled Upside Down, hosting the Critique exhibition in 2016 and 17. Inside Out, Not So White Cube, which included museum solidarity lobby and culture shutdown projects, also traveled to the National Museum of the Visual Arts in Montevideo, where it transfigured into exhibition Flood, the problem of institutional crossing between Eastern Europe and Rio de la Plata. Through these exhibitions, the Museum Solidarity Lobby projects continue to interrogate the trajectories of institutional critique against regional politics and the specific parameters of artistic production in Eastern Europe. I'm coming to the last part of my talk um, that will deal with um, institutional critique. The conceptual framework of museum solidarity lobby projects draws from the legacy of artistic practices that over the 1960s and 70s became known as institutional critique. Political in nature, these conceptual art practices interrogated the core of the art institution seeking to reevaluate the European um, Enlightenment's promise, as um, Alexander Albero and Blake Stimson put forward, that museums and art institutions would advance, quote, the production of public exchange, of a public sphere, and of public subject, end quote. The first generation of institutional critique artists sought to in uncover the discrepancy between power structures of the art institution and the acclaimed pursuit of publicness through various forms of critical interventions. They exposed the museum's power structures and hidden biases, 
making the social, cultural, political and economic underpinnings of the museum subject to public scrutiny. Their critique of the museum's ideological apparatus led to the blending of art criticism with the artistic practice as a new form. Especially relevant for the political agenda of the Museum Solidarity Lobby projects is the work of the Artists Workers Coalition, AWC, a political movement that began in 1968. AWC artists pursued their political agenda through creative work, shifting the relationship between art and politics. One of the objectives was the securing of the public access to the museum. In their statement of demands, uh, AWC outlined the movement's ideas about museum leadership and its financial stability in form of a manifesto. They demanded that the museum governance be split among its three constituencies, equally divided between the museum staff, the patrons and artists. Other demands regarded representation and exhibition and called for free museum access, as well as dedicated services and programming for excluded communities. All these demands favor decentralization of the museum, open access and inclusion of marginalized groups, uh, for example, women and minority groups. The lobbying activity of the movement was often disseminated in form of public pamphlets. Similarly, as a part of my Museum Solidarity Lobby projects, I used public banners and postcards that I distributed in public for free. I positioned the critical uh, artistic dimension of my work in the tradition of Hans Hake, one of the key protagonists of the AWC movement, and the first generation of the institutional critique artists whose work uh, greatly influenced my practice. Hake followed the funding trail of the art institutions to interrogate the relationship between the museum's financial sources and their governance. His work exposed how the capital exchange between the museum and its sponsors affects the framing and value of art. For this reason, Hake was frequently censored. For example, his solo show at the Guggenheim Museum was cancelled due to controversies around his project Shapolsky et al. Manhattan Real Estate Holdings, a real-time social system, as of May 1, um, 1971. Hake took the censorship of his Guggenheim exhibition as an inspiration for the creation of new work, such as the Solomon Guggenheim Museum Board of Trustees, in 1974, which indexes the corporate and political affiliation of the Guggenheim Boards of Trustees. While Hacke's investigations into the museum's financial and governmental ties inspired my research about the political causes of the budgetary crisis in several uh, cultural institutions in Bosnia and Herzegovina, the work of other artists such as Mirle Laderman Ukeles informed my thinking about the ideological underpinnings of museum architecture as a medium and a site for museum solidarity lobby. Ukeles' exploration of the labor division between the janitor and the conservator over the maintenance of objects inside the museum not only called attention to the labor exploitation of maintenance workers, but also declared that the museum's safeguarding is itself art, something Ukeles called maintenance art. Ukeles' work resonates with the questions posed in the Museum Solidarity Lobby projects. Who will protect and maintain the cultural heritage in the National Museum of Bosnia and Herzegovina if no guards, preservationists or administrators can be paid or hired? My work also references the second generation of institutional critique and its recent reassessment following the line of questions by artist Andrea Fraser. Fraser critiqued both the institution of the museum and its audience by extension, questioning what type of viewer the museum produces. In her 2005 essay called From the Critique of the Institution to the Institutionalization of Critique, Andrea Fraser acknowledged that the institutional critique has been instrumental in deconstructing the ideological foundations of the museum, 
introducing a significant transformation of the institution of art. Today, the frame that allows something to be called art is now broader than ever. Still, as Fraser pointed out, the underlining um, relations of power in the art institution remain the same. For her, today's institutional critique is not so much about being against the institution, but about what kind of values do we institutionalize? Quote, what forms of practice we reward and what kinds of rewards we aspire to, end quote. These insights inform many of the contemporary forms of institutional critique, such as the artist-led protests against the exploitation of migrant workers in Guggenheim Abu Dhabi by Gulf Labor Artist Coalition and the Gulf. In contrast to these recent artist activist practices focused on Gulf museums, I position the political agency of my work within the potent exchanges with the audience that result from activist charged art in public sphere, while remaining fully conscious of Claire Bishop's criticism of equating democracy in society with democracy in art. I follow Andrea Fraser in asking what kinds of institutions are needed today. The Museum Solariality Day is exemplary as political art that defends art. This work is a key example of my role as a provocateur in public sphere that relies on my cap um, capabilities as a designer to mobilize visual images in the urban space. The project triggered real change by altering public opinion through aesthetic effect, which inspired broader activist network um, in the legal realm. In the end, the multi-annual collective alliance of many different artists and activists, um, both locally and internationally, succeeded in making the Bosnian government uh, back down somewhat and provide some support for the country's cultural institutions. In the National Museum in Sarajevo reopened in 2015. While the collective lobbying effort led to a reopening of this particular museum, the established of a countrywide uh, ministry uh, for culture and the legal definition of all state level cultural institutions um, as, as state level institutions in Bosnia and Herzegovina remains to be uh, resolved and lobbied in the future and the funding is um, hand in hand um, still an ongoing problem. Bosnia and Herzegovina's cultural institutions are keepers of unique historical and cultural treasures that enrich the world's cultural heritage. The artifacts and artworks they maintain were created through the meeting of different cultures, religions, and civilizations. The history of coexistence in Bosnia and Herzegovina is unique in the world and can provide insightful perspectives for the future of coexistence in Europe which is why this cultural crisis needs to be analyzed and addressed through both the local and an international lens. The objective of my work within this broader context is then to reevaluate the role and relevance of state institutions, such as the National Museum, in the era of supposed post-nationalism and to incite a truthful discussion about their relevance and responsibilities going forward. What happens when a state-level cultural ministry is non-existent, underfunded, or when national endowments for cultural institutions are cut, when policies directed towards shrinking support for the former props of public culture and funding vanishes, as we are witnessing now all over the globe due to COVID-19 pandemic. If a nation's cultural heritage is part of the web of cultural, uh, world cultural heritage, if both citizens of Bosnia and Herzegovina and members of the world community are injured when the cultural heritage is damaged um, and rendered inaccessible, if we, in fact, have a right to culture, what types of institutions need to be put in place to secure our cultural rights in the future? Museum Solidarity Lobby projects I presented explore how the museum crisis in Bosnia and Herzegovina and others like it could become a catalyst for a new understanding of citizenship, cultural preservation, and agency of participatory art. The notion of lobbying for the museum introduces a unique perspective to the discourse of institutional critique. 
it embraces various historical artistic strategies of critiquing the museum's institutional power structures and its instrumentality in both colonialist and nationalist projects, while simultaneously and paradoxically creating an understanding of the museum as a site in which we can begin to reclaim the lost notion of public virtue. Unlike institutional critique in the West, my critical position emerges from the significantly different sociopolitical conditions of Eastern Europe, where artistic practices historically have been directed at developing a better functioning of art institutions. As curators Denka Badovinat notes, the cooperation between artists and institutions was of crucial importance to the survival of art in the times of political instability in Eastern Europe. This legacy continues in the work of contemporary artists in the region, such as Irvin, Tadej Pogacar, and Yusuf Hadjifejovic in Sarajevo, for example. Museum Solidarity Lobby builds on the work of these artists and responds to the specific context of the socio-political transformation processes that have traversed and remade post-socialist Eastern Europe. The transition from socialism to neoliberal democracy unhealed wounds of the genocide, and an ongoing ethno-national conflict. Specifically, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, the political context is characterized by the condition of balkanization, in which the government itself acts as a central force of decentralization, destabilization, and fragmentation. The state is sabotaging its own institutions. Paradoxically, Precious artifacts and other items of heritage that survived the systematic destruction of the 90s war are now being destroyed, or at least uprooted in peacetime. What is at stake in Bosnia and Herzegovina, I would like to argue here, is nothing less than the cultural history and memory of coexistence in the Balkans, as embodied in the archives and works of art that are kept in these institutions. Preserving this history and memory of coexistence from being liquidated is relevant for the future of peace in the region. These institutions also function as symbols of Bosnia and Herzegovina as multi-ethnic state. The cultural treasures kept in these institutions belong not only uh, not to individuals or political parties, but to all citizens of Bosnia and Herzegovina, regardless of their religious, ethnic or national affiliation. These institutions represent the temporal and cultural force of Bosnia and Herzegovina's sovereignty, and consequently, the collapse reflects the collapsing of the state, the thinning of its legitimacy. Museum Solidarity Lobby makes a case for the museum as a positive instrument for state building and peacemaking in the Balkans. Yet, to restore a society after a war is a complex task given the massive scale and systematic nature of the destruction in the region, I believe that the restoration of cultural heritage needs to go hand in hand with the restoration of social networks, cultural life, and educational infrastructures. Take, for example, the old bridge in Mostar, which was blown up by the Croat Defense Council in 1993. This masterpiece of the 16th century architecture built by the Ottoman architect uh, Hayruddin was a symbol of centuries-long coexistence of Muslims, Catholics, Orthodox Christians, and Jews in Mostar. It might have been restored to its original form using original rubble material, but the symbolism of coexistence that this bridge embodied is left in ruin. Today, the new bridge physically reconnects the two sides of the river, river Nevretva, but does nothing to bridge the divide between the two warring parties. The Mostar's old bridge is a physical symbol without social meaning. More than 20 years after the war, Mostar is still divided city where Bosniak and Croat high school kids learn opposing versions of their shared history. Problems of this kind are too large to be tackled by a single artist, architect, or a scholar. Still, I believe that contemporary art and architecture can do a lot to inspire, to initiate, and to invent new models for slowing down and reversing the downward spiral of conflict. 
Museum Solidarity Lobby offers some creative ways of critiquing and shifting perspectives on the established norms of cultural preservation. Culture Shutdown assembles a new infrastructure to reimagine alternative modes of preservation in the cultural sphere. Artifacts have agency, as the Future Heritage Collection uh, objects uh, teach us, in creating a sense of connection with stories and histories of other people. We see our own life story in them. They evoke a sense of empathy and sometimes sympathy. They allow us to play with reality. The types of artifacts brought in for the exhibition of the Future Heritage Collection were telling. A glass of the Olympic icon Vučko, an emblem of Sarajevo's 1984 Winter Games, proposed not just as a nostalgic reminiscence of the flourishing times, but recalled to us to socialist design history, cultural heritage not recognized in the post-socialist claims over heritage. A seven-year-old boy's making the Bosnian state flag out of Lego after the war, when the Bosnian flag is being edited and reinvented year by year. No one can agree to what kind of nationalism they adhere. Traditional textiles, coffee grinders, and home items that show how food and customs can transcend ethnic, religious, and national borders. An ancient pocket clock from a poet's grandfather, a real piece of pre-digital archaeology. And finally, the tool of the artist, a photo camera brought by um, the commissioned project photographer who survived the execution by firing squad in eastern Bosnia. Today, he lives in Sarajevo and makes a living from photography. This was his first camera, one that the artist used to document the sites of atrocities in eastern Bosnia, mass graves, of which, um, one of which nearly claimed him. In what ways can people in Bosnia and Herzegovina reclaim their shared history and create new cultural capital for civil society to overcome the violence of competing nationalisms? Museum Solidarity Lobby brings this question to the space of the museum and its various constituencies, both present and the future. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you, Azra, for this wonderful presentation. Um, you leave us with many questions. Uh, it was a great presentation and a, and a very, very important and relevant one. Um, and as you said, I've asked you to talk about the Culture Shutdown Initiative, um, mainly because so far we've been talking a lot about the siege and the after effects of the siege and the direct kind of effects of the destruction that happened after and reconstruction and kind of like the role of all of it in its um, collective memory. But we haven't really touched concretely about the after effects of like the war in the many levels uh, directly on its cultural institutions. And so you've, you've really defined all of it tonight in, in a very, very kind of systematic way. Um, and so I will open the floor to questions. I have some questions for you. I'm sure the audience has some questions for you. So first, let's see um, for, for the people who are present in, in Zoom uh, room with us, feel free to type in the question for Azra. I can read it out loud for, for everybody to, to You can ask them in Bosnian too, if, if it's easier. And Yes, we also have international students and, and participants. So whatever language you guys feel more comfortable with, please, um, now is the time to ask questions. And in the meantime, maybe I can start, um, I can start with a few things. Um, we actually had Leila Hodgic at Kuma International Arts School, and she was talking about this idea of cultural resistance during the siege. And she talked about all these kind of ad hoc exhibitions and activities and all these things that were happening um, as a way of like everyday resistance. You know, it's like art was used as, as a way of resistance. And then today in your lecture, you're talking, you, you were talking about 
this continuation of the conflict, not in an armed way, but like a systematic destruction of a common ground, of a common language, of a common past, of common historical narrative that continues even, even today. Um, and that's why I wanted you to talk about the Museum Solidarity Lobby, because it's a very concrete action that took place in a very positive one that had a huge effect worldwide, the effect that, that you know, following that act, it did its um, initiative as well. And I wanted to ask you, um, obviously you've done a lot more work since, and you, I know you also worked in other parts of the world, but I wanted to ask coming back to Bosnia because you know it's very relevant and, and I think we need to talk about the current day um, situation. Um, cultural sh shutdown happened, I think in 2012, correct? And it's been eight- Yeah, started 2012, 13. Mm -hmm. Right. It's been eight years since, and there were many kind of good things that happened as a result. And it seems like we're, we've come full circle, like the, you know, the, the governmental changes didn't really happen. The ministry, the, at the level of the, the National Ministry of Culture never kind of like formed. And now we're kind of starting back to where you guys left off in 2000 and 2014. <laughs> right? going in circles. <laughs> And so I guess my question is, what is your vision of the whole situation today? How do we pick up where you left off? I mean, you know, th there were other crises and other things that you kind of had to work on and, and, and like move on in a way, in a sense, you, you kind of gave us a good platform, but it seems like somehow the momentum has, has um, come full circle. So I just wanted to ask you about I feel the problem uh, remains the same as it was then, as it is now, and this is that we need a constitutional reform. And it was the, you know, that's at the core of resolving the issues of institutions. They point at the very core of the question. I mean, I'm not a political scientist, so I kind of am hesitant to go too much in that direction because I'm not very skilled in that discussion. But the question of the political is underneath of all these cultural debates and the problems of institutions. And, uh, and I don't know, um, uh, you know, we have lost a lot of time since the war, the Dayton Peace Agreement was meant to be uh, revised at some point, but what in fact happened uh, over the last, uh, you know, more than 20 years is that those, um, animosities that were created in this brutally constructed landscape that is artificial, um, it, it solidified the borders uh, in, in the country. And it's very hard to now move because we have lost a lot of opportunities. And Amrahaj Muhammadovic will speak also about these issues. I think she's doing very important work on kind of using cultural heritage and preservation um, processes to kind of reconnect uh, people and to reflect uh, on uh, shared uh, values and shared history. But, you know, significant projects like Mostar Bridge, it's not about material form only or about this kind of like building of the museum and having it open or not. These institutions need to move on. They need to be able to do research, to engage participation, to invent new forms of um, education. And for that, they need funding. It's not the lack of, I met a lot of these uh, museum workers. I mean, these are wonderful people who have, and they've been accused of all different things, but. I think they are heroes, and I'm so glad that Aktia did these uh, wonderful actions to acknowledge their work because these are people who kind of, you know, carried their work voluntarily. I mean, they got nothing for it. Um, and it's difficult, and it takes really a lot of courage and will to, to do that, and we should be grateful to them. Of course, you know, not everything can be done if you have nothing. And they are incredibly inventive, actually, how they work in these um, context of, of um, yeah, lack of support. But I think all of these points to the same problem over and over. And this is the problem of politics, which in the end does not benefit the Bosnian people, but benefits transnational corporations uh, and large interests that are kind of exploiting this country um, while, you know, our politicians are battling among themselves. This is, if you zoom out, what is happening. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a kind of, you know, um, 
yeah, down to earth knowledge. So. Yeah. And I think maybe the next, the next issue that we will have to face within the next generation, because now we're talking about preserving of the shared heritage. And unfortunately, with the new generations who are growing up in these parallel, let's say, historical narratives and, and almost parallel worlds, they're living together, but in, they go to school under, you know, one school and two schools under one roof, and they're learning about this, like, um, two versions of history. And the question also becomes about, like, the, the future work for the generations who might not have had the memory or the knowledge or the experience of this common past, right? What happens in the next steps? And this is not to, you know, we should also not romanticize that. I mean, there's also this kind of tourist version of Boston. It's like, oh, Jerusalem of Europe. I mean, I use it too in my lectures because it's, it's appealing and it's positive and in this uh, kind of disaster of contemporary politics. But I, you know, the past wasn't that rosy either, um, but at least, in the Balkans, people have managed to coexist and live next to each other. And I mean, when you have this, um, you know, majority of villages having these churches and mosques next to each other, at least they stood next to each other, right? And that is, an, for me, an evidence of, of coexistence and the fact that it was possible. Uh, maybe people didn't intermarry and had problems and tensions in families if this happened, but people are intermarrying still. Um, and so these tensions always exist and what I think we need to do, and this is where culture has a really important role and is uh, architecture has that vehicle um, to kind of deconstruct these ideas of pure national identities, right? We are all hybrids. We all have local and, and individual and very paradoxical identities. Um, to kind of understand that is very liberating, right? So when you know, and I was lucky enough that I had grandparents who took me to the early, different religious buildings, to the museum, um, to understand um, the context in which I grew up and to learn to love it. Right? When my grandmother died, it was so touching. Uh, she was very devout Muslim, but in the house, there were, you know, there were like Serbian neighbors and a kind of, atheist communist family and some kind of really like super religious people above her and so everyone was coming to express their sorrow in their own custom and sometimes in our custom and sometimes in her custom and all of this multiplicity was possible and i think that's really beautiful you know it, it didn't matter because what mattered is that that neighbor came and expressed and shared that pain with our family, right? And I, that's something that was cultivated also through spatial relationships. Um, um, and we see that very clearly in, you know, um, minarets that look like church towers because they were built by Christian masons in Herzegovina. Um, I mean, there's a kind of historical interpolation. We see it in um, Islamic decorations uh, in the Bosnian synagogues, for example. You know, there are many examples of that kind of hybridity. It's not very uh, easy to clearly cut who is who and what is what. And uh, we could all live uh, much more um, easily if one could see this context as an enrichment rather than as, as an obstacle. Now, I, I know a lot of people in this audience, I'm probably preaching to the choir because people come to this kind of, uh, so that's why we also sh should go out there and um, kind of engage maybe um, those people who don't think this way. And mm -hmm. We have a few questions yeah. from the audience. So uh, here, I'll read the first one from uh, Nicola. Nicola says, incredible topic and even better conclusions. Amazingly and clearly uh, explained one of my favorite lectures so far, very good lecture. I would only um, ask one question and that, uh, would, that would be oriented towards the present situation. How effective is this concept in principle, for example, in the current situation in Sarajevo? Has it pushed significantly towards a better position of our institutions of heritage? Yeah, I think, um, I, I, I'm assuming, thank you, Nicola, for the kind words. Um, I'm assuming you are referring to the concept of lobbying. Yeah, I think, 
I mean, we have seen the effects in a way. It was beautiful and there is this spirit of citizens so kind of pushing and hoping and kind of putting pressure. I think this, um, this kind of process needs to be seen long term. Um, uh, it's a, lobbying is not a kind of event that will have one action that produces success. And that was what was so beautiful with the um, crisis of the institutions and a kind of momentum it generated. Because I felt that directly after the war, people were so numb by the, um, and horrified by the you know, war and everything that trauma that inflicted on people. But um, there was this positive moment, like we care about something, right? And there was this really touch to the core of people, okay, like Yasa Musei de Aktia. I am the museum, I'm the constituent of my country. And that understanding that actually I'm the one who holds the power of the state. So if we indeed you know, would have a real democracy, uh, we do need to understand the core principles of power. And um, as Michel Foucault has taught us, um, you know, you, the people hold power as long as those who are not in power kind of accept that they are to be ruled. But uh, at some point, and there are very important concepts in political theory, like from Jean Sharp on nonviolent resistance, where again, culture and architecture of um, different forms of inat, like look at the inat kucha, right? These are moments of individuals who are uh, kind of claiming power and resisting to, um, to those um, uh, yeah, structures and, and oppressions of the, of the ruling class. But of course, it's a longer process. We need political education um, and a kind of broader awareness uh, and, and yeah, education in kind of principles of citizens' engagement. And that's, I think, again, where institutions and artists, architects can have an important role. Uh, and in the end, all of that should somehow inform the voting, but also political engagement of citizens. Anyone should be able to kind of start a party and, and start lobbying. In Bosnia, I think the situation what I see from the outside, I haven't been living there for some time now. It is difficult because larger players are at stake from the outside uh, also kind of uh, determining what is going on there. And, and that makes the question of solidarity among Bosnia and Herzegovina citizens the more pressing that they understand that they actually do have a shared interest to survive among these external larger players. Mm -hmm. Again, I'm getting into a discussion that I'm, I'm not a political scientist. <laughs> but it all comes let's back stick, to let's stick to architecture, please. <laughs> of course, everything political ties in Bosnia. You can't, yeah. It's difficult to escape um, that field. Um, thank you, Azra. So we have another question from, from Azra as well. Azra Dubravic asks, hello, thank you for your presentation and all the key points that you mentioned. Very important topic and very well explained. I wanted to ask if the constitution doesn't change, what is our next move? What can we do to preserve our cultural heritage and to upgrade our museums? I think you kind of touched upon that with this like kind of more political engagement. Um, and uh, what can we do to preserve our cultural heritage and to upgrade our museums? It breaks my heart seeing all the conditions of the museums in uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina and it should always be a wow factor in something that's unavoidable because it's who we are and what made us um, today. I think, thank you, Azra, for this um, great question. I think, um, well, it is hard as we always ask ourselves as individuals, what can I do? And, and I think in, in many cases, it's wrong to expect something from individuals only. I mean, these are matters of policy, like the problems underlying here are questions of policy and they need to come and be resolved by the government. But of course you have a right to vote, but there are options for people to um, kind of do something on their own. And we can see uh, kernels of that happening already in process of reconstruction. Um, in my PhD dissertation, I studied the processes of reconstruction of mosques in villages across uh, Bosnia. And it was very interesting to see a kind of different approaches that people are taking. Some are kind of competing with the grand Saudi visions and you know, Turkish donations. The others are um, um, 
like one mosque in uh, Beksuya in Zvornik, for example, I met an imam that was, was so impressive. He was actually a history teacher, um, someone who understood the value of not building a megalomanic thing, but actually insisting on reconstructing um, something that would insert people's historical claims to land and to coexistence, right? So Zvornik is a city where all mosques were destroyed, even the rooted like foundation stones were dug out, graveyards were dug out. Um, um, I mean, to literally deroot that community out of that city. And it was very difficult for them to rebuild. I mean, it's hard to even, you know, create a kind of economic uh, uh, stability for yourself when you return to a place where you have the opposing ethnicities governance. Um, but they wanted to reconstruct. There were a lot of urban plans being changed so they cannot reconstruct uh, buildings that were destroyed, um, uh, kind of huge concrete buildings being built on places where ancient mosques stood so they cannot reconstruct there. So there's this uh, architectural warfare happening in the space of, uh, kind of post-war reconstruction. But within that realm, these guys coming and not building a kind of defiant, crazy structure, but insisting with the community that they reconstruct a small structure just as it was. They have no plans of it. They just have some postcards and like pictures that they had. And from that, they tried to reconstruct it. And I found that uh, such a touching um, attempt right, to say, okay, um, we will, we, this process is about healing all sides. And we want to reconstruct what is the core value behind this uh, type of building. It's not necessarily to signal the presence like I'm here and I'm bigger than you are and I'm going to build a gigantic thing. But no, to reconstruct that history. We have been part of the city for centuries. We want to be back and we want to live there with you together, right? And that statement for me is very powerful. I don't know how these people do it uh, who survived so many, um, you know, torture, rape, um, things that were meant to forever extinguish the, their desire for coexistence and they still have it. I'm uh, just in awe of that kind of human resilience uh, and power to transcend that um, kind of lower consciousness state and be in the, in the way of um, you know, just a kind of still be a human being and try to connect on a human scale. And I think that is possible. You see it in these villages where people actually do manage to connect and they reconstruct um, their um, life and their cultural practices. Right? Um, and I hope that they can get support from, and, and architecture can provide some medium for it. It's not a solution. And I mean, the solution and the kind of major tools are in the legal and governmental realm. And that's where every citizen can have a role and press on the kind of, I mean, who you vote, press the public opinion, but also get engaged in the political discourse if possible. Thank you, Azra. Um, do we have any more questions for Azra? I didn't see any more questions. And we've kept you for quite, for quite a bit of time, but I think we've raised a lot of good points and a lot of open-ended questions that there are no instant kind of solutions or let's say answers to, but we really thank you for being with us uh, here today. We hope to see you soon in Sarajevo, maybe in person, who knows, next year or the year after that. Uh, it would be a pleasure to host you here uh, live. Um, thank you, Azir, for being uh, here with us tonight. Do we have any more questions? No, no more questions. Thank you so, so much for the invitation, Leila. And thank you. Thank you. I love the festival. I'm excited to see uh, the other talks. Um, so we hope you keep following us, Azra. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Next week, we, I mean, on Thursday, we have Amra Haji Mohamedovic. Uh, she'll also be talking about uh, the cultural heritage and conflict and doubt. Uh, uh, so that's exciting. I think she will be also touching upon many things that you brought up today already. So um, stay with us, uh, all of you. So I wanted to thank everyone for being here tonight. Uh, keep, 
keep please keep um watching we are with you every tuesday and thursday for remainder of october and um until uh thursday we are back with amra haji uh, muhammadovich and we once again thank azrak shamia for being here with us and uh, everyone as well thank you stay safe everyone wear masks <laughs> See you soon in Sarajevo. See you soon. Bye bye. Bye bye, Azra. So I'm just gonna leave. Should we leave to to have the recording, um, Claudia? Or yes, I will. I will uh, end the video now and try to upload it on Facebook. Perfect. So thank you, everybody, and for the comments, for the thank yous. Um, all of you who were here with us tonight, who are going to upload the lecture on Facebook. It's not live, but still, I think it's really worthwhile watching this great presentation that Azraq Shamia gave us tonight.